Good evening, everyone. Um, bear with me. I'm just going to switch my camera off now just uh, so I can add the free guest to Wings Monthly Episode 3. Bear with. Always, when I hear someone join, all all of us, all of us are. I hope you can actually hear hear and see me, right, lads. Good evening. No, it's your end. All works well. Elliot, can you see everyone? Uh, I can see Andy. Uh, I can't. (laughs) I can't see anyone else. Oh. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, I can see three of you. As long as you can hear me, gentlemen, um, then we are good to go because all I can see all four of you from my point of view, so I can at least record the video. Honestly, God knows what is going on with Instagram tonight. So for anybody who's just joined, we had a practice, uh, my understand, and nobody could see each other. We could hear each other, all right. But Mystery. We're good to go with what we got. Um, so first of all. Thanks to you three all to join. Um, really, really appreciate you joining tonight on the third episode of Wings Monthly. Myself and Dan aren't going to introduce ourselves because hopefully by now you know our beautiful mugs. So I'll hand over to Elliot, who's the bottom left corner of my screen. Elliot, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Uh, yeah, I'm Elliot Marsh. I am the co-founder and editor of the Vintage Aviation Echo, a uh, previously a digital publication, soon to become a new print magazine. Lovely, thanks, mate. There's plenty more to be said about that uh, in the coming moments. Um, Andy, uh, who's also the plane modeler on Instagram, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name's uh, Andrew Curtis or Andy Curtis. I am a kind of composite of traditional like making, airfix and you know, traditional making, but then also kind of moved into the world of die cast a few years ago, and which I'll explain a bit more later on. But yeah. Lovely. Now, cheers, guys. I've just noticed we've all got beards again. It's, it's literally the beard show, isn't it? We're like, we are literally a BG's tribute band. It's beautiful. And yeah, uh, first of all, just before we get stuck right into it, um, a bit of the agenda tonight. So obviously, we've done our intros. We're going to hand over to Elliot in a minute and ask him, uh, we're going to grill him Gestapo style about the Vintage Aviation Echo. Um, a really exciting prospect for anybody who's into Warbirds, aviation and magazines. Um, we're really excited and really proud of him to have him on today. Uh, someone I've known for a number, of, well over a decade now. Um, and he's got a fantastic product, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, then, we'll, started, um, then we'll hand over to Andy, who's going to talk about sort of bridging that gap between modelling and die casts. Uh, we're going to talk through some latest releases, a little bit of a controversial Hobby Master poster, um, which Gary, who's not uh, on just yet, who was very critical of, uh, not to name and shame him, of course. Then we're going to talk through some expectations for the Corgi catalogue, which is catalogue two in May 2024, which is due out, and some of the woes that Corgi have had in terms of some of the finished product that's come through. Uh, we'll talk about some of the latest editions that have joined all our collections. Uh, then we have the lovely Andy Beck on to do his raffle draw, which um, hopefully you've seen the Insta stories, which is a huge, huge win for somebody coming their way. Uh, and then we're in. If anybody's got any questions, there's a question tab in the bottom of your page. Uh, especially it'd be great if you can ask them during the sections, particularly for Elliot and Andy. Uh, and then I can ask them at the end of some of the questions that we've got for them as well. But Let's rock and roll, folks. So, first of all, I'll hand over to the man himself, uh, King Henry VIII Junior, uh, Elliot, who um, obviously is from the Vintage Aviation uh, Echo. Um, so, Elliot, uh, obviously, just to get you going and get you get you warmed up. So, just tell me a little bit about the Vintage Aviation Echo and sort of where it all started off. Sure. So uh, a couple of friends and uh, and my brother and I established the Echo uh, as a website back in um, early 2017. Uh, the idea being to cover historic aviation um, in depth with feature articles, editorials, uh, insights and air show reviews. Um, the website quickly grew in profile. Um, we published frequently from 2017 through until early 2022. 
working with a lot of operators in the UK and the US, um, along with aviators and others within the industry, um, you know, publishing feature length, feature length articles for the most part. Um, we then took a hiatus from 2022. Uh, I met the woman who is now my wife and family life and um, kind of bedding in that, that home life really took precedence over anything else. So we had a hiatus of two years during which time um, it gave me the chance to sort of sit back and think about what I wanted to do with the Echo. Um, we'd worked with a lot of kind of big and, and quite exciting names, you know, people like uh, Steve Hinton Jr., John Romain, um, you know, Nick Gray, guys like that, who are, are kind of big names within the industry and recognisable names. Um, and I, I really have the time to sit back and, and, and consider how to move the Echo forward. And it felt like if we were going to come back and and start publishing again, it, it felt like we'd really exhausted the online option. Um, the website always did well. You know, we, we had tens of thousands of, of people viewed it all around the world, but it, it was starting to feel, the website itself was starting to feel a little bit tired. And really from a personal perspective, I was thinking more in terms of how to put something out to the market that um, that offered something that, you know, bridged the, maybe bridged a gap in the market. So we, we kind of threw around a few ideas and, and from that came the idea of launching a print magazine. Um, initially, we had the idea of print or putting into print articles that had already gone on the website, but very quickly it became apparent to us that, you know, that, that wasn't really satisfying the itch to do something more. Um, so we have um, put together a magazine that is all new content for the most, uh, it's all new content with a couple of articles that have been pulled from the website, updated with new photography, with new writing. Um, and that is due to launch in uh, probably ju late June, maybe around the time of the Cywell Air Show. If not, then certainly during summer 2024. Exciting stuff. Dan, over to you. Yeah, I know you mentioned um, you started off with your brother, was it, Elliot? And a couple of other people and bits and pieces. But who's going to be involved with that going forward? Is there any newbies coming sure. onto the scene? Or is it all just the... Yeah, yeah. So we've... Um, no, so we, we, we've, we've... What we wanted to do is to really put together a team who we felt complemented the, the ethos and the vision that we had for the magazine. What we're going for is um, a high-end journal with curated articles the idea being images and words are given are given equal precedence and equal space to breathe um and for that we've really in, in, kind of in terms of photographers we wanted to look beyond the usual names that you see in all of the magazines and actually aim to use a photographic style um some reported style photography that perhaps you wouldn't see in the mainstream magazines you know the magazines tend to stick with the same the same kind of style of photography um we wanted to do something a bit different and i think it's it's probably fair to say we've drawn inspiration from automobile magazines where um you know the the style of photography is it, perhaps a little bit more kind of rough around the edges but it, it's a narrative style it tells the story of the in this case the aircraft that all the people who we're writing about so to that end um we have on the team um, leading the sort of creative direction is Harry Measures, who is, um, I would say, one of the best kind of behind the scenes reported style photographers currently working in historic aviation. Um, he's worked with the Fighter Collection and with Flying Legends as a live side photographer for more than 10 years and is a, an absolutely amazing photographer. He captures the human element brilliantly. Similarly, um, Phil Chaplin, who shoots for the Shuttleworth Collection and the Imperial War Museum, is also contributing uh, to Volume 1 and hopefully will be a regular contributor going forward. Again, his style of photography, if you haven't seen it, look him up on Instagram because it is, it is a style that I think no one else really does as well in historic aviation. Um, again, it's, you know, it's all about the people. It's about narrative and telling the story of an event or of an aircraft. And, you know, the behind the scenes element of that, I think, is something that the magazines have perhaps neglected. Um, Hugh Hopkins was one of the co-founders, along with Harry, my brother Greg and I, back in 2017. He is writing and providing photography for this. Again, wonderful photographer, um, a very competent writer. 
and he has an article in um, in volume one. The graphic design is being provided by um, a young designer called Oli, uh, Oliver Stevenson. Again, if you've not come across Oli's work, look him up on Instagram. He is one of those frust kind of frustratingly talented young individuals. You know, he paints beautifully, he does graphic design, and he takes fantastic photographs, both on digital and film. Um, he is doing the title page designs for us and um, has just blown us away with what he's produced. We gave him uh, we gave him a detailed brief for a couple of articles to sort of test the waters, see what he was was really capable of, and he has absolutely over delivered on that. So I think Ollie's designs are kind of what I think they are one of the main things that sets us apart from anything else on the market. You know, he has done these elegant, beautiful designs, and it really complements the, the 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 photography and the written work. So that's the core team. Um, there are the photographers involved as well. Uh, John Dibbs, um, who I'm sure most here will know, he has photographs in a couple of the articles. Um, Phil Prinzing, a German photographer, has provided work as well. And there are numerous other individual um, individual photographers who um, I'm sure many of you will recognize their work when, um, if and when you see it in, in volume one. So that's that's kind of a, a precy of, of who's involved in, uh, in the magazine. Sounds mad. Okay. Fantastic. Check you out and name dropping pretty much everybody in the yeah. vintage. I believe. <laughs> Over to you. So you talked a lot about that. I'm a former head of creative and agency, and I know you talked a lot about the, the kind of the photos and, and that kind of stuff. What what can we expect from the write, writing side of it, creatively wise? Is it a different? Are you approaching it from a different way than your traditional magazines that are already out there. I, I I think we are. I mean, what's what's interesting to me is is kind of having published um fairly frequently but you know on a more sporadic basis with the website i found that it was falling into a very similar style and um it's a style people seem to like but i think what's interesting with the magazine mm -hmm. is to look at varying the offering for each article so that when you sit down and you read it everything is slightly different and i'm very conscious that stylistically um the bulk of the writing comes from me and on that basis um i've sought to change up the style the written style of some of the articles um so that you know there is a, a variation there um if you've read the echoes articles online it's very much along the same the same kind of line so you know we're talking in-depth feature interviews trying to get to know the personalities behind the aircraft um you know not just kind of give a, a high level pricey you really want to dig into um you know into the personal and combining the personal with you know the history and with the technical i think is something that we've really you know we've we've been striving to do that since we launched and i think it's a formula that has worked for us so you know it's it's not going to be a massive deviation from that um if you liked what we did before i'm sure that it will be you know that the writing in this will be for you um and there are some fantastic subjects covered in it which um which I'm very excited to to unveil as uh, as we get closer to the launch. Brilliant. So uh, just just to interject, so welcome to everybody who's joined the stream to to watch again. You know, just to emphasise, if anyone got any questions, someone chuck in the comments or the question bit uh, at the bottom of the page, please do, and we're far away at Elliot as best we can. Um, just so I to carry on outside of the question. So you spoke about the difference in that and you know we've all grown up with fly pass and aeroplane particular in the uk it's the two i guess to to name drop the ones out there but what makes it different to them is it more to supplement them it's not a competitor is it it's more of it's more of a supplementary publication i would say yeah i mean I, we're not looking to compete with the mainstream magazines you know they are long established they have huge print runs huge distribution we are simply put we're not in a position to be able to, to to kind of to challenge that nor do we want to you know we know lots of the people who contribute to those magazines who you know who write them who run them and um you know they're friends of ours so that there isn't there isn't any kind of competition there with those mainstream magazines i think what we're what we're doing is offering i guess what you would describe as a premium kind of high-end product the idea is it 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 sits as nicely on the shelf as it does on the, on the coffee table. Um, it's going to be, you know, 200 plus pages of content, which is 
you know, twice, probably twice the size of your your kind of standard mainstream avi- uh, aviation magazine. And the presentation of it is um, is substantially different. You know, if you pick up aeroplane, aeroplane and fly past it, it has each of them have their house styles. This is a more pared back kind of a, a sparse approach. The idea is, you know, we give we give, uh, I guess, a weight uh, to the imagery and to the writing. We're not overwhelming people with, um, you know, reams and reams of, of text on one page or, or kind of, you know, a scattershot approach to image placement. It's, um, you know, the articles are longer as a result. Um, you know, one or two of them are kind of upwards of 20 pages, but it, the idea is those narratives kind of unfold as you turn the page and I think having seen the designs that we've we've had back recently it it does stylistically look very different to anything on the market um I think we can confidently say you know aviation historic aviation enthusiasts in particular won't have seen anything like this before um Warbird Digest the the U.S. publication um that was running for several years and, and then had a resurgence and I think wrapped up in 2022. That's probably stylistically is probably the closest to what we're doing, but there are still, you know, significant differences between what they were doing and, and what we're, what we're trying. Um, you know, we want it to, to look and to feel like something with, um, with weight and authority. And I think that's, you know that kind of size and, and and the weight of it and the presentation is really what sets it apart from from the mainstream magazines fantastic dan over to you mate i mean i'll be brutally honest i've not actually physically bought a magazine in person for god knows how long but i will buy one of these just because i'm interested to see what what you can produce where where where's it going to be available is it going to be air shows only or can i walk into a local tesco's and pick one up from there where can yeah so it? so it's uh, initially so i mean it's probably worth saying we're we're doing a pre-order system which will be live from the 18th of april um we picked mm-hmm. the 18th simply because that is um that's the day that we launched back in 2017 so it felt like quite a nice you know a nice point to aim towards so, so you'll be able to pre-order online um in terms of actual in-person sales, we're we're in discussion with and going to be approaching um, specialist magazine outlets, aviation outlets, and um, hopefully we'll have a, a, a reasonable distribution network where you can actually you know walk into a shop and physically physically buy it. Um, we're also talking to um, to one or two you know operators within the historic aviation world who may become stockists and they would sell it at air shows if that does come off um and there will obviously be digital distribution as well in the sense that you'll be able to go on our website and we'll, we can talk about that in a bit and and you know buy a, a copy through there um, initially we're doing a limited edition run um we're testing the market we don't want to kill ourselves commercially and it doesn't take off so um you know it'll be limited numbers initially um but I think that plays into the idea of of having kind of a more exclusive product. You know, will it will be it will be a limited run. Um, there will be a finite number, and I think the idea, hopefully, is that people are inspired to buy it. You know, word of mouth will um, will hopefully spread a positive word, and um, and you know, we'll pick up sales through um, you know through those various outlets. But once once that runs done, if if the money is there. And that's me being completely honest. If the money is there, we'll do another, you know, an extended print run on mm-hmm. volume one. Um, but it will be a finite number. You know, we're not going to have tens of thousands of copies floating around out there. So I think given the size of it, probably around 224 pages or thereabouts um, with, you know, 12 feature articles within it and just the sheer length of those articles, I think, you know, it, it, it will feel like an exclusive product. And I think, that's really another thing that sets it apart from the mainstream magazines. It's not a monthly publication. We will get volume one out there. And the idea is then probably it will be a six month wait for volume two. Um, we met with, with someone within the, the aviation industry recently who pointed to a French, uh, a French publication. I think, a, I think a surf publication and you know, that their whole ethos is we don't actually tell people exactly when we're going to publish next. We want to build the anticipation. We want there to be a smaller number, you know, and a smaller number in circulation. 
it becomes a sought after product and then there's a real demand and a real want for a second volume and that's kind of what we would what we would like to do is to really to kind of wow people hopefully all being well blown away with what volume one offers um and then there's an expectation for volume two and when that has reached a certain point you know at that at that at that particular point where we then you know launch into volume two brilliant and yeah my question was going to be about the, the frequency of, of how often your magazine you mentioned there you, the first one coming out it's kind of second one in six months is that you thinking every half a year or if it got popular you would make that timeline shorter i think yeah i mean the, the point with all of this i suppose for us is that we we juggle this on top of day jobs and family life as well um so that that may be the kind of limiting factor for how often we do it it might not be you know if, if volume one is commercially successful we have volume two already in play to a degree and i've mapped out probably the first six or seven editions i mean it's a movable feast in terms of the content but you know we have interviews either completed or lined up for volume two and three already and the others there is a plan there um, with some interesting kind of narrative through lines throughout them you know so we are looking ahead into the future um i think i'd love to be able to say what one day we would do it quarterly but i think that is a long way off i think we have to be realistic mm -hmm. i think volume one in summer 2024 and then hopefully you know winter 2024 25 would be the publication of volume uh of volume two and if it continues to go well, then I'd imagine we'd continue at that pace, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, if the demand was there, then I think there's certainly the possibility of accelerating that. But um, it also, you know, it also depends on the style as well. I mean, we're, you know, we're talking about kind of 10 to 12 feature articles, but they are lengthy articles. Um, there's an article which I want to put into volume two, which is probably about 11,000, 12,000 words, which is you know, four times your typical <laughs> magazine feature. Yeah. It's enormous. It's a weighty tone, but the idea with this publication is, is something that you would quite happily sit with like a book and just take that in and let that story kind of unfold. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, I'd, I'd love to think that frequency, that we, it, the frequency will, will kind of improve um, as time goes on, but I think for the time being, it will be, you know, every six months. Um, another thing I just want to point out as well when talking about the limited edition run is we're not going to be making it available digitally. Um, there was a lot of discussion early on about having a digital magazine that would run in tandem with the print. Um, commercially, that would probably put us in a better position, to be honest, because, you know, you would sell it at a lower, a lower figure and people would buy it all around the world for, you know, half the price of the print edition or whatever. But that doesn't fit with the ethos that we're that we have for it you know this idea of exclusivity and and you know having something weighty and and real um you know i hate the word bookazine but that kind of fits with what we're doing um and a kind of coffee table magazine type concept uh, to me it would not necessarily devalue the print run but it would it would likely siphon off some of those sales into into the digital realm and i, I just you know, we've we've got mock-up previews that we're going to be making live on a, a PDF reader soon, and I'll I can talk about that in a bit. But they look great, but it's not the format that it's intended to be read in. You know, it's I really don't buy into the the print is dead mantra. I think I think being brutally honest, people who say that print is dead have probably been burned by spending money on magazines of a, a poorer in quality. Um, and there are fantastic magazines out there. I mean, Aeroplane, you know, Aeroplane that Ben Donnell edits is is fantastic. That's a must buy for me. Um, Wings magazine came along a few years ago and has published a couple of volumes. They, um, you know, they have a, a unique voice. And I think that's what the market needs. I think having a unique voice and something that is distinctly you that no one else is doing is the key to making these things commercially viable um i have no interest in being fly past version two you know they they do what they do but i think there's an opening to do something that is um substantially different and that will capture people's imaginations 
and give historic aviation perhaps a, a depth of polish that it hasn't had in print for a long time, um, potentially since the days of Warbirds Worldwide, which was the publication I grew up with. And it's probably, you know, the, the DNA of that kind of runs through the veins of the Vintage Aviation Echo, albeit we aren't, you know, we're not Warbird centric. So uh, before I get on to my uh, question from, from us, and I'll hand over to Dan and Andy if they've got any more as well. I've got some questions from Jamie McGaffigan, the aviation aficionado, and of course our old World War One chum, Michael Lowe, who's on the previous episode. So just to re-emphasize, please get comments or the question at the bottom of your page, firing across the at the very end. But the final bit for me, and I guess it's sort of like this sort of like teeing you up for a, a nice juicy volley in the six yard box you know, for a football team. So can you tell everybody where they can sign up to get the uh, obviously the the news and the obviously the preview of the magazine? And I'll share that yeah. at the end of the video and put it in the comments. Absolutely. Um, so we have a new website which is specifically for the magazine. That is vaemag.com. So vaemag.com. Um, if you head there, at the moment, there is an overview of what we're doing. There is a, um, a detailed FAQ section. Um, and on the 18th of April, we will uh, add a PDF reader, which will have the first two double-page sp double page spreads from the majority of the feature articles um, available to view. There will be an online shop where you can pre-order a copy and once they're actually printed in the summer, you'll then be able to order all your copies through that, um, through that online shop along with a range of, of kind of associated merchandise as well, um, which will include prints and other, you know, other kind of memorabilia. Um, in terms of, of the preview, Use the, uh, I mean, I would drive people to sign up to our newsletter through the VAE Mag website um, because they will receive um, a, a preview in advance, which will include, uh, you know, those double page spreads for a couple of articles that we won't be putting on the website, a couple of our leading feature articles, which um, for various reasons, largely owing to the sensitivity of the photographs, they won't be public per se. But if you sign up to the mailing list, then um, then you'll be able to see them through, uh, you know, through that through that newsletter prior to the 18th of April. Um, in terms of the content, to give you an idea, um, we have uh, an interview with Pete Kinsey on flying the P40C, Fighter Collections P40C, which includes comments from Matt Nightingale, whose team restored it out at Chino. Um, there is uh, an interview with John Michelle Munn from the Shuttleworth Collection on converting to and flying with the Havilland Comet. There's an article on um, Seb Mazzuchetti's uh, Spartan executive out in France. There's a, an interview with Mikhail Carlson about flying his Blerio. Um, there is an updated career interview with John Romain, which is a fascinating insight into one of the most elusive figures in historic aviation. Um, and beautifully illustrated by archival imagery and his his son's um, spectacular photographs as well. Um, beyond that, I, I would say check back on the 18th of April because we, there are a couple of surprises in there as well. New restorations that we've um, that will be included with some uh, with some fantastic interviews. So. It's it's going to be twelve, you know, twelve uh, twelve feature articles and uh, more than two hundred pages of content. So um, yeah, we to say we're excited is an understatement. It feels like we've taken on a massive project and we're starting to feel the burn of that at the moment. Um, when I finish my day job, pretty much every hour is every extra hour that isn't family time is spent writing um, and designing and doing all of the other kind of ancillary work that goes into this. But it's. Um, it is immensely rewarding and i think we've really I, I having seen the designs and the kind of initial print you know prints of those of those articles i think this is going to be something beyond what we've ever done before and genuinely think it is a product that will stand alone as something that that you know historic aviation enthusiasts just just won't have seen before So, over to Dan, have you got any more questions? Not necessarily any questions, no. I mean, I, I, I love the sound of it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And as a page, obviously, we, 
I've not actually met you in person, Elliot. I, I do hope to in the future, somewhere along the lines, either an air show somewhere or whatever. Um, but as a page, we we love supporting uh, and doing what we can to help out um, businesses like yourself, small businesses, big businesses, whatever. Um, but we'll do everything we can to share your sort of like everything you put out. Um, we do help out Andy at Loftus Hobbies um and everything that you you put out on your socials and every we'll do what we can to promote you as well um it sounds great i appreciate that thank you um, with as a page and i know mark is anyway because he, he loves everything warbird um we'll support you wherever we can i appreciate but, yeah. that thank you but yeah kind of that andy have you got any more questions for Andy? yeah no no questions for me i just could listen to him talk all day long the obvious passion he's got uh, aviation and and to do what he's doing is an absolute credit to yourself i love the fact that he talks about being disruptive against the market as well doing something that's different and, and challenging the norm is something that i've always wanted to try and do and, and do so yeah really excited and, and can't wait to get my hands on the first copy it's gonna be a good read yeah. no i completely I appreciate I that completely yeah. okay. that's what the two boys have said there but got a few questions from the people watching um, I don't know if you're allowed to reveal this yet, but Jamie McGaffigan has asked, are you allowed to reveal the price as yet? Um, no. <laughs> 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 only because... When you, only, I mean, I, I, I have a price in my head and I have a discounted price that will be, um, that will be available to pre-orders on um on the 18th of april for a period of probably six weeks I, I say no only because i don't want to say i don't want to give a price and then have to row back on that we're, we're in you know we're speaking with printers at the moment we we have a printer lined up who has given us um who has given us a good quote um what we're currently trying to work out are things like margins and all of that kind of boring stuff um which you know, is part and parcel of, of launching a small business and, and trying to figure out how to, to make it work and give it longevity. It, it, it's a premium price. Um, I think fly past retails at about six pound. It will be considerably more than that, but I think you have to take into consideration, firstly, the size of it. You know, it's, it's, it's effectively two, two of those magazines kind of strapped together. Um, the quality of the content, I think, photographically is um second to none you know the photographers involved are are genuinely some of the best in the world um i don't like to it feels very unnatural to kind of big up your own writing given that i'm writing the majority of it but i i would like to think that the writing holds its own it. <laughs> it's worth seeking out you have to do it um, yeah. if you can't pick your, if you can't pick yourself up then you have to uh, we can all yeah, exactly. Mark struggles. exactly Mark struggles but <laughs> um so yeah i mean i think th there are lots of reasons why I, I why the price point will be will be higher than you know your your kind of standard uh standard mainstream aviation release what i would say as well is um you know the, the, you, you also kind of have to look at, at the, the frequency of publication you're buying something that will initially at least be a, a you know a six monthly release um we're not asking you to part with that amount of money every month and I think the length of it and the depth of the articles is, you know, it, the feedback we've had so far is, you know, it's something that you will continue to dip back into. Um, so I think, you know, I, I would say temper expectations around pricing. It's not, it's not going to be any more than 20 quid, but it, it will certainly be more than 10 pounds, put it that way. I wouldn't, I, 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 from my point of view, I wouldn't, uh, I completely understand, obviously not wanting to give the, because obviously if, if you do have to up it, and you have to go back on a price and you've given i get that completely i wouldn't be too like the price wise if you go if you compare it to obviously with diecast if you compare it to the diecast world and you compare this is going to sound dreadful but obviously you got the likes of the easy model stuff which is cheap 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 bottom end of the scale mm -hmm. and i'm not comparing that to fly pass because that is awful because fly pass is a great magazine but if you compare that at six pound fly fast magazine, easy model, 20 quid F14 Tomcat, you go up the spectrum 
to a 140 quid caliber tomcat and then compare that to your mm -hmm. regime if the quality is there which it sounds like it's going to be it's why, why why wouldn't you spend money on that i mean i've just seen recently i'm sure it was a uh, uh i think it was a super hornet book and book i like i like that word you use book come out mm -hmm. that was I, I i wouldn't personally i think that's a ridiculous amount of money um but if you if you're i don't know if if you if that's something that people want it's obviously sold well mm. um i i think you've got it i think you've got a great hit i really do the hornet book's an interesting one and I, i've been mulling that over myself because it, it looks fabulous but it's, it does, it's what is it, 120 or 160 euros or something like that um but i mean i think yeah yeah you you, you are really quite right in terms of I just need to apologize to jamie He's prescribed. I, you knew I was going to bring two more <laughs> but it's a book. It's a book comparison. <laughs> Um, no, I think I think you're quite right about the kind of premium price point. I mean, you look at the automobile magazines, and you have, uh, you know, Octane magazine for those who aren't familiar. Kind of retails at about five fifty, six pound. Um, it's actually a fabulous magazine. You know, it looks great, but it is absolutely. Stock full of adverts. You know, they, that's how they're able that's to keep their problem. pricing down. Yeah. Well, this is it. I mean, we, you know, to be to be clear, we will we will have a small amount of advertising, but it will be a small amount. It will be in premium positions, and it will also be ads that fit with our ethos as well. Um, you know, it will be high end products and and the like that you know would sit well alongside the feature content. We're certainly not kind of cramming in. A load of uh, you know, load of column inches of of ads or anything like that. But I, I think you know, on the pricing to to go back to the automobile point, you have your Octane at a lower level with kind of cheaper paper quality and that sort of thing. Then you have your Magnetos, which are what about eight pound, and then you have the Road Rat, which is kind of very premium, high end coffee table magazine type fare, which I think retails at about seventeen fifty, eighteen pounds. Um, but you know, if you buy a product like that, that it, you're not just buying an off-the-shelf magazine. You know, it's. I'm not going to say it's an investment. That sounds slightly ridiculous. But it's, it, it. You know, you're buying something which hopefully has longevity, and you you want to keep it safe. You want to keep. You know, they're the kind of things that sit on your shelf and you kind of carefully leave through them. Um, you know, with the greatest respect, I have an, a, a dog-eared copy of Airplane that I take to work with me to read if the train breaks down or whatever, and it's absolutely battered. I would never do that with a magazine like the <laughs> like the Road Rat, simply because you know yeah. it's it's just a different um, a different quality of 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 publication. When I say different quality, I simply mean in terms of uh, you know the production the production values and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So that leads very nicely onto the next question. Uh, I've got a couple of questions from the aviation aficionado who's, um, who's obviously joined the stream tonight. So the first bit he said, he said, maybe run some cool gear ethics model raffles with the magazine, like a golden ticket or something, or winning behind the scenes walk around of warbirds in the magazine would be cool to do. And I guess that's something more if you get established where you can build those relationships and i guess but then you've also added that you, you know although there's a small element of advertising which helps the running of the magazine i guess that's something you sort of almost come away from as well is so how, how, do, how would you feel about that was that is that something potentially you do further down the line yeah t t to a degree um it's something that we've talked about the kind of adding I guess adding value in a sense and bundling things together to sell as uh, you know magazine plus X Y Z. There will be a version of that when we launch on the 18th. So from the 18th, you will be able to buy the magazine uh, in tandem with um, one of two prints, or in co or as a, a a kind of art package where you have the magazine and you have three prints, and obviously the price is then you know kind of goes up incrementally. Um, that's the initial basic level but in terms of things like behind the scenes visits raffles that sort of thing you know absolutely there's there's room for all of that stuff um you know we we kind of sorry my my office light just turning itself off um we, we kind of dipped our toes into the the patreon market a couple of years ago um back in it was around the time of covid and we we offered 
we offered a, a, a prize draw where the winner had a private tour of the Heinkel 111 restoration at Hawkins, and they got to go in the fuselage, sit in the cockpit, and that sort of thing. So we, you know, we've we've kind of dipped our toes into that market. I think we have the relationship with operators within the industry to be able to offer some pretty cool things. Um, will we do that initially? Probably not, but certainly down the line, if not tied in directly to, you know, subsequent volumes of, um, of the magazine, then I think, um, it, you know, it, it, it could be things that we offer through the website, for example. So yeah, there's, there's definitely scope for that in future. And I think, um, I think it's coming. It, it, it just will be, you know, we're, we're talking slightly further down the line than, than the initial launch. And obviously the launch as well, we want it to be very much, this is the magazine. This is what we want you to, you know, to, 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 to kind of focus on at this stage um, and establishing that as, as a new product on the market. So, again, the Aviation Giardo has got another one as well with regards, and I guess this sort of ties into what you spoke about before. We would be able to see a sample uh, of the publication before it goes live? Yeah. So if you, if you go head over to vamag.com, um, you, you can sign up to our newsletter on there, and there will be a, uh, a fuller version, a fuller preview going around before the 18th, and that will include the first, it will include the cover image and the first two double page spreads of the majority of feature articles. Um, that will be vis viewable in a, a, a kind of standard PDF viewer, um, and it will give you an idea of what it will look like in print. There will also be previews added to the website that you'll be able to view without joining the newsletter, um, which will be slightly pared back. It will still include, you know, a number of features, but there are a couple of the, the leading ones which we won't include. Um, I, th I think I, I mentioned it earlier just for, for sort of photographic reasons in, in um, you know, photographic licensing issues is basically the rationale for that. Um, but that will give you a, a, a real, I think, a real insight into the look and feel of a thing. You know, you'll have those title pages designed by Ali Stevenson. And, um, you know, in some cases, you'll have the, the kind of the preamble and the start of the articles as well. Lovely. So our final question is from our World, one, World War One aficionado himself, Mr. Michael Lowe. I don't know if he's still on. So he's, he's just put in the questions. Tab. I'm a member of the Great War. Uh, group, a bunch of historians looking at World War One with fresh eyes. I don't know if it's fresh. He's about 83 and he might, but uh, uh, we have a periodic publication called Salient Points. The boys might want to check it out. It sounds like the same sort of ethos and blend photos and texts. So I don't know if you've heard of that, um, but it might be worth something looking at and just um, sort of seeing if it's something you can tie in with or not. But will World War One be covered as well within the uh, VAE? It will. Um, what I would say, uh, just as a, I guess as a, a as a key point to take away is this is a this is a preservation focused magazine. Um, it won't cover. There won't be sort of historical articles. Um, no news. No airshow reviews. No historical articles. That is, that you know, other people do that stuff brilliantly. I think our strength lies with the with historic aviation preservation. Um, so yeah, there will be World War One aviation. There certainly will be in edition one. Um, the Blerio, Mikael Carlson's Blerio from Sweden, or his Tulin to be um, to be exact, will be featured um, along with hopefully another um, another World War One type, which I'm still trying to get the interview for that wrapped up because I want it to go in volume one. Um, Mikael Carlson's Fals D8 is one that we really wanted to cover in volume one, but we just he hasn't been available and you know that is regretfully something which we've not been able to cover in volume one but certainly will follow in volume two um along with uh the shuttleworth collections bristol fighter that's an article that i've actually already written that it will definitely be going in volume two um so yeah from a preservation perspective in terms of world war one aircraft restorations and insight into operating and flying them there will be at least at least two World War One articles per volume. We want to keep a balance. I mean, this you know, volume one features World War One, interwar civilian, um, and then you know, through to your sort of Second World War and post-war warbirds. So hopefully, you know, hopefully something. I'm not going to say something for everyone. Uh, we don't have any classic jets in volume one, but 
you know, what's your space in the future? Um, and I think the, the offering will be broad enough that hopefully, you know, hopefully there'll be, uh, be enough content of different, different styles and different themes to, to appeal to the majority. Lovely. Look, look, first of all, um, just want to say that Elliot's been at work all day. He's still currently at the office in central London. So that first one probably needs to lie down there after 45 minutes of being lambasted with different, uh, different questions. Um, but look, if, um, if, if someone could question. deliver me a beer, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but look, first of all, thanks for coming on, mate. But look, from my point of view, obviously I've known Elliot well over a decade now, and you know, most air shows, you know, you know, if I take my little boy Rafe along, we you know we all sit together with many of the people who contribute to the Vintage Aviation Echo, and many a great weekend has been spared, uh, you know, spent at Duxford, you know, sitting on the flight line with these guys, and. From my point of view, obviously, you know, I'm going to be a little bit biased, but they put so much love into this um, publication, not just the publication, but the, the website before and the writing is another level to what you get in aviation magazines. For anybody who's read the website, I've been on the website and read the articles. I mean, the Mark Hanna one really, really stands out. You know, an amazing piece of writing, some great photography. Um, you know, with some great insight from the people in and around the, the man and the gene that was Mark Hamm. And I am, I, I honestly, I can't say enough, you know, and give him an, enough love about how proud I am to know the guy and, and how excited I am to see this publication come out. It's more than what you deserve. Um, you know, all the boys involved in it, from Harry to you, you know, you know obviously the crazy man that is Greg Marsh. I don't think he's joined the actual... Uh, uh, stream tonight but you know so proud of you guys i'm really really excited to see this come to fruition and i cannot wait not just the first one but the many publications that will follow so from my point of view watch this and when i share the video out please get behind the guys you know this is an exciting new magazine that's hitting you know hitting the market and i really want you guys to help them and make this a massive success because they absolutely deserve all this success as well so Look, thanks, mate. I really, really appreciate you. Um, I would just like to add as well, I don't think Kristen's on, your, your, your lovely wife. Uh, I'd just like to add, it was not me who got you into model aircraft. We're <laughs> <laughs> getting further, further down the line. Look, uh, cheers, mate. Look, really, really, um, if really, I can, really if I, before, yeah, for, I, I really, really appreciate that, Mark. And just, just before I, um, I am going to drop off because, as you say, it's, uh, I was up at six this morning driving to London and now I'll have to drive back to, uh, to, to East Kent. So, I will um, regretfully drop off and, and, and make for home and then for, then for hay. Um, but just to add, to pick up on a point that you mentioned, the Mark Hanna series, which we, we published a five-part Mark Hanna um, retrospective in 2021, that will be reproduced in print, and the first part of that will be in volume one, um, which means we have to commit to at least five volumes so that we can complete that series in print. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that... That should also um, also hopefully have an introduction by Sarah Hannah, Mark's sister, um, which she is writing at the moment, which wasn't included in the um, in the online version. So yeah, um, a lot of people said when we produced that, they said, "Can we see it in print?" You you will very soon be able to. So um, yeah, we're very happy to um, to be reproducing that in print. But yeah, Brilliant. thanks for listening to me for That's so long. Perfect. It's uh, no, no, you're on, mate. It's the first time I've talked about doing this magazine with anyone outside of a very select few people, you know, the team and the contributors. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to come on and just to chat about it with, us, with, with others and actually tell people what we've been doing for the last, <laughs> last year. Uh, so, yeah, really appreciate great. the opportunity. Thank you. No, we look forward to sharing the absolute shit out of it that dare i say not that it's shit in any means but i mean we will <laughs> far and wide and hopefully everybody who's watched this will do the same as well and give it all the love it absolutely deserves go on mate you get yourself away you get yourself home to your lovely wife and little boy uh and i'll speak to you relatively soon okay Cheers. so yeah, thanks thank all. you elliot have a good really one really thank you it. elliot okay, so what i'll do i will uh, I share this video on the wider screens, whether it's a Facebook group, whether it's the Instagram or YouTube. I will um, obviously put the links on how you can sign up as well to sign up to the newsletter for and and go from there.
Um, before I get on to the next guest, who's been longing to get on to this, uh, the, well, it's only the third one, but I mean, he's been eager to get on uh, for a long time now, uh, Andy. If you've got any questions for Andy, um, who's going to talk about modelling and, well, I say modelling, I mean, he doesn't like posing like scanty, clad underwear or anything like that, uh, just to disappoint you all. I've been talking about Sunday. Um, he will be um, obviously talking about that. Uh, if there's any questions you guys have got, please put them in either the, the comments section. I'll try and take them down um, and all the questions bit. Um, I want to obviously, you know, obviously give him give him a grilling as well. Um, so Andy, just I feel a little bit left out not wearing a baseball cap. What's that, mate? Hold on a minute. Just before you start, I am going to have to shoot. All right. Andy, don't take that as me being rude. <laughs> we'll catch up at no, the time, all right? No worries, mate. I've got to, I've got to shoot off. I'll okay. catch up with you soon, Mark, all right? Yeah, no worries. Thanks for joining, Dan. Really, really appreciate it, guys. Mate. Really, really appreciate it. Just before yeah. I do shoot off, I do plan on doing a uh, like a little review for our Instagram and YouTube channel on everybody guessed a, a Super Hornet. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got a few to review now, so I'm going to get back on the review. A little collection to go. And get them uploaded, so... Uh, I'll see you later. Have a, good, have a good chat, guys. No worries. Take care, mate. Good, Cheers, mate. good having you on, mate. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. So, Andy, over to you. So, tell me about how you got into, obviously, starting scale modelling um, and how that sort of turned into diecast as well. So, oh, when I was a kid, I used to do the traditional with your dad sitting at the table doing a bit of modelling, and I used to enjoy that as a young lad. And then... As I got older, kind of disappeared, didn't do it, wasn't interested, but I still was always interested in aviation. I live up near Duxford, Bishop Storford, so I was always going there was into the air shows and in Northfield as well before that closed. Um, big and Hill, all the big air shows I've kind of been to and really enjoyed. And it wasn't until COVID, I was actually living in Dubai uh, and we got locked in Dubai in a serious way where you weren't, you got a thousand pound fine if you weren't at, if you went out of the house and kind of it was seriously kind of, so I bought a few kits in. I did a uh, FX 148 uh, Mark 22, I think it's a bit far. Um, and then since then kind of just got back into it in a, in a big way. Um, I haven't been brave enough to move on to um, airbrushing as yet. Um, there's quite a few people keep trying to get me to come and show me how to do it. I'm always just a bit wary of, of doing it. So I've stuck to the hand brushing um, and, and I got into that kind of thing. I started building it. And then my dad always had a quite a nice little selection of Corgi planes, had about, I give about 30 or 40 of them. And uh, I kind of never really thought about buying them myself. Then I, I got to a position where I could afford to, similar to yourself where Mark and I, I started buying one and then two, and then suddenly the collection grew and grew. And, and now I've probably got about 300. Um, nowhere near yours, Mark. You're, you're my you're my stable mate. If I ever have to show my wife saying I've, I've got too many models, I just show a video of your old your house, and I, it gets me away with a lot of things. So, um, yeah. So that I've now got next to me most of my collection, my die cast, and then I'm lucky. I, I, my office. I'm a teacher. I then take all my airfix and I put it up in there. I've got another kind of display cabinet which I take all my stuff up and I display in my in school and then I've got a design club at school I'm a design teacher where I then do airfix and we do kits and stuff for the kids at school and try and inspire the next generation because for me that's the big thing with die cast as well as the airfix stuff um, is to try and encourage the next generation to get into it um, otherwise it's going to be something that's going to die out within our generation let alone the next after that. Um, so for me, that's kind of my story of how I've got to having a massive collection of die casts as well as a nice collection of 148 scale is the scale I mostly do. So, uh, it's funny you just mentioned that in terms of airfix, do they do anything to encourage schools to do like group stuff like that? Or is that something you, you could... No, I dropped a couple of messages to some of their team on LinkedIn. I um, haven't had a reply back to, but yeah, it's something that I think they should be doing. I um, mean, if it's Rebel, Airfix, any of the big brands, but for me, Airfix being the big UK brand, I'm, I'm lucky I work in a private school um, with, with, and we've got plenty of good facilities. Uh, there's, there's some people that have tried to do it before, but they gave a, a level five B17 kit and some kids hammered that and it didn't get very far. <laughs> I've just seen I've seen some of your bits on Insta stories. So obviously, to give you a bit of a shout out, um, you've obviously signed on as the plane modeler today. So anybody who's not following Andy, please sign on to the plane modeler, uh, or, or, or obviously you know follow Andy over on Instagram, who, who shares all his group builds, any new uh, call gear come through the door. Um, I'll, at the end of the call, obviously, I'll I'll ping you some some names that you can potentially contact Airfix about because I think that's a brilliant brilliant idea and. You know, we, we see it at air shows. You know, often at Ducks, don't we? The Ducks of yep. September show, air 
set up in the in the super hangar and you know they've got kids knocking out pink and yellow spitfires that look like yeah. Mr. Block. But that's where you start. Yeah, I don't, you know? oh, I remember I, I'm not really bothered about the finish. It doesn't have to be. If they want to do in camo and they want to, I, I work with in my school 12, 13 year olds up to 18 year olds. And even that divide, I've got kids that are coming at, in year 12. So, I, you know, I buy this, I go to Audi and get the six pound Spitfires and, and bottle, you know, the, the simple models, they've got their starter ones. And I'll just get them to start off with. And basically, all they need is one of these and some of that. And then off they go. And then they can, they can crack on. And then it's, it's something that they can and build and do what they want with. Some will go really intricate and want to do the full camouflage. And others will just get primer out and I'll show them how to spray paint. If that's, they're just gaining some basic skills into how to do modeling, that's amazing. If other kids then buy, which I, I know they are now there's they're getting their christmas and birthdays and they're taking that, that that further on and they're now sending me pictures of their models they're making it home but for me that's the most exciting part of this if this hobby for me is that side of it do you know what though you've sort of almost potentially i hope someone from airfix or corgi is watching this um you know potentially they might be but yeah. in almost them tied into the national curriculum what a brilliant way to do it so you talk about right yeah, I mean, I spoke to Rafe, and next year he's doing World War Two, and he's asked me to come in to talk about the Battle of Britain because he he goes to school in Hornchurch, which of course was a sector station and a major station. I can do a little bit on RF Hornchurch and stuff like that, and to bring some of my models for a bit of a show and tell and stuff like. That. It's a brilliant way of tying it in there. Just imagine you're learning the Battle of Britain. The best way to learn about the t the two main RAF fighters in the Battle of Britain and the ME one hundred and nine or the Heinkel is yeah. to bring a to get the kids all one section builds a Spitfire, one section builds a Hurricane, one section builds an ME 109. What a brilliant way to educate. Again, it's that, you know, it's the best way to educate kids. We'll bring this to life. It, over the show, but, you know, that's what kids do. I mean, even now, at my age, I still paint it like Stevie Wonder, dare I say. Uh, I'm, I'm a lot better than what I used to be, to be fair. It was, it was really poor at first. I could build the things really well. I just couldn't paint them. Yeah. And it's a great way of, tying that in you know post covid as well almost it was a great opportunity to get that involved but that's something i've, I've never heard of before that a school is doing that and i think it's a bloody brilliant bit of a uh what's a bit of a maverick bit of a um I always start with the uh, the first session I do. I watched it. I don't know if you ever saw it. James May made the life size version, Airfix Bit Fire. Yeah. And for me, that's such a brilliant video to show students about, you know, that, that this isn't just something, a little hobby for old men to do. It's something where you can, you don't have to be 85 plus to be getting into modeling. You know, you can start young and it's just great to show that 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 process of making that spitfire um and then you can do that in a mini version and that kind of is the starting point and then i go from there and then some do hand bracing and then we get i i haven't got, I have got an airbrush at school now which is what i'm trying to get set up at the moment but one of the big things is yeah it's with the tin spray pans um spray canes you just get them from hovercraft that's my the latest i was supposed to go up last weekend up in in a uh, tiger moth at duxford unfortunately weather permitted stop me so i'm going to rebook that for the summer so i was going to make the plane i was going to fly into that was my plan but simple models like that are just nice for, for students to put together and then they, they hopefully they, they take it on and if they only learn how to spray paint properly without spray paint going everywhere then that's a, a great starting point yeah so a couple of questions that we've just seen in the comment a couple from Dwayne. um yeah. can we have models and also he said i like your work on the model b17 so the one you're having to rip apart and repair and, yeah, yeah. and get with the kids obviously build it wrong um what camera do you use uh for pictures i've got so two, two cameras i've got my s24 samsung which is the newest samsung which is an unbelievable piece of phone for kit uh, but the big thing for me i spent 35 for me 30 quid and bought a light box um and that's where uh, not being but yeah i think some of my photographers probably maybe die cast are some of the best not be big headed but just because I've got a nice setup, I can put it all. The, I can put it in. I've got at school. We've also got a massive one, so I can then take it. And the Vulcan fits in it, for instance, easy. So I can take and go and actually put my bigger aircraft in that and take some really good photos. And that just makes such a difference. And um, even if you start with a white piece of paper bent back over the top of each other, uh, and you take the photos on that, that will make such a difference. Uh, there's, there's some really simple ways that you can just take nice, nice photos without having to bend loads of money on kit. I mean. My wife, your phone that you've got at home will be absolutely fine if you can just find nice lighting uh, and a decent background. Sam's obviously put as well. So Sam, who's, who's regularly on obviously the chat as well, he just yeah. said he went to the wrong school. Would love to have knocked out some airfix and DT. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you know what? I'm I, I building rubbish wooden things out of for no particular reason. I would have stayed after school to build them. To be honest yeah. with you, I think. Yeah, 
good way. Yeah, group building. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking. I want, to, I want to do a Vulcan with them at some point. I'm looking at doing with my upper six group or some of my low up and six, my six formers are doing a Vulcan build together because I think they'll enjoy that process. But uh, yeah, it, it's. I mean, design technology. We went to school is completely different now. Uh, we, we, our school, we don't make bird boxes, in, and, and it's more about the creative process. And you design, develop each of whatever you want to make. So one of my students last week, he was. Uh, what's the um where you have the little figures and they fight each other um I mean, uh, cool. well, awesome. yeah yeah so yeah. he wanted to make a paint set to hold his paints and he did that at the competitions and he couldn't carry his paint so he developed and designed his own little paint holder um that he then took with him and that was his project and that for me that's super exciting that each student has their own creative process and they can take it wherever they want rather than having to just make the same old thing that the kind of the, we all did maze games and boards and, and all that kind of bird boxes and stuff that's brilliant Brilliant. So what's been, I guess, no, from my point of view, what's been your favourite build so far? Oh, my favourite build. One of my big ones I love, uh, I know you, you've seen it a few times, I, I've always wanted Corgi to do Sally B. Uh, and they're never going to do it. I know there's too much political stuff behind the scenes, but I took a B-17 Memphis Bell that had been smashed and broken up, bought it on eBay for £35 or something, took it back home, um, and, and some good friends of ours helped me along the way, and, and then I bought the decals, and I redid that, so decal version, the diecast version of Memphis Bell using um, the, the, the decals off of, uh, you can buy online. That was probably my favourite one that I've done so far, that I've been brave enough to combine the two hobbies together. Um, yeah, that's something I definitely want to do more from. Uh, the other one, I've got a couple up here, the Mosquito 148 scale, uh, View 5 that 148 scale. I've enjoyed them lately. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably, yeah, Memphis Bell probably was my, the one I loved. So what, I know you obviously, you generally, uh, for anybody who follows you, you generally put two or three options on there and get people to choose your next yeah. build. What's yep. the next three you're going to be choosing through? Uh, well, I've got a D-Day build that I've got on the moment. So I'm going to do something a bit different. Nice. That's not a bad one. That's part yeah. of so a little pipe i've not not done one before i've not built one of these kits before either it was in hobby hobby crafter doing a good sale at the moment and um, so that was i picked that up um i'm just not been they've got the 124 spitfire which i'm tempted to get it's 25 percent off at the moment which is a big saving on a 100 pound kit um so that might be my next big purchase from a, from a kind of airfix point of view the typhoon is an amazing bit of kit but then so is the um i think it's, is it 132 the hellcat or is that 124 uh 124 as well that one and the other one is the mosquito at 124 oh. that's the other one but that I, good god the prices of that are extraordinary I bet. I bet the the hellcat is an exceptional bit of kit it's fantastically um modeled i think you know fx have absolutely smashed that out of the park um so another one from Dwayne. he seems to be getting quite a few uh questions in now um but well, sorry, let's get go for a few other pieces. Uh, so not another train set. The Tiger Moth flight experience at Duxford is awesome. Um, look, anything at Duxford getting off the ground there is obviously is historic. Um, to Dwayne's ask, um, what's your favourite fighter uh, and favourite bomber of World War Two? Ooh, favourite fighter. <laughs> I've always had a decision. Uh, one day I definitely want to get up. Either, and uh, it's a question you can answer as well. The, it's a Mustang or a Spitfire. I, I, I love the, the Spitfire because of its heritage uh, and what it did for, for us as a cut. But the Mustang is just a, a beast of an aeroplane that I, I can never decide. If I get to a position where I can afford to spend two and a half thousand pounds to go on either one of them, it'd be a tough decision which one I go. Um, Buy about 500 quid. Which one? For some reason. The What's Mustang, that, mate? The Mustang is cheaper. It's cheaper, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, is that from North Wheel? Or do they find them? And I'm it's one of North Wheel. Oh, do it now. Um, so I will do it, and Big and Hill do it. So they use the Rolls Royce historic flight, uh, one Warhol, nice. so Big and Hill. Uh, and Cywo have obviously just got in Jersey Jerk, which was Snifter, the, Austro the Royal Australian Air Force one. But Jersey yeah. Jerk, obviously, they've got rid of Country Mary, but Jersey Jerk is arguably the best scheme i've seen on a mustang in years yeah it's stunning really that i've seen that yeah and bomber wise i'd probably go with an old boring one but the lancaster the b17 i was very lucky as a kid um my dad knew one of the chief engineers on sally b so i was able to have a wander through her on the live day um which was unbelievable yeah one of them little, little moments you don't forget um and then um yeah just jane is the other Corgi version, I, I, luckily I've two of, so one I will sell at some point. But yeah, the, I've got two of them, and that's one that I think is all collectors of, of Corgi. If you can get that one at a decent price, then yeah, yeah you're winning. Gave me that one. Never, never seen. I should have pulled me the trigger on it when it first won the sale at um, 
the Lincolnshire Heritage Centre. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't for some reason. I thought, oh, I'll get one further down the line. I'm not bothered about VRA um, or yeah. VRA. Uh, don't really do it for me, but um, it would be nice to have, of course. I'm a collectaholic. But um, to answer Dwayne's question, it's a Spitfire 9 and a Avro Lancaster. That's the answer from my point of view. Yeah. Any, I mean, I love, to be fair, I love an early Spitfire. A Mark, I prefer it's either a Mark 1, a Mark 9, or if I was to give you specifics, uh, P9734, which is the one which went to America, which is the one that had J on it, which Corgi have done. Yeah. That's my favourite. Yeah, got that one. Mine would be JEJ, not the one that Corgi had just produced, just a plain JEJ. Uh, and the Mark 14 will be the silver and red Spitfire, which is at Duxford, the high back one, which is RN201, which is, again, it's in the collection. They're my three favourite Spitfires, um, in all honesty. But, yeah, the Avro Lancaster for me, um, beautiful, beautiful aircraft. That sound, just oh, even now, what just the airs on the back of your neck, doesn't it? So, getting on to diecast. Yeah. So, uh, what's your favourite? Favorite die cast in your collection? I know, obviously, you mentioned Sally B, but sort of take that out of the equation because that's one you made up. Yeah. What's the one really? Oh, I love really the, gets... I'm a big fan of D-Day. My great granddad landed on D-Day beaches and landed on swords. And he was on like, the second wave and then went through um, into Holland. Um, but yeah, he, for them, for me, the D-Day collections. I've got four Dakotas with, with, with up there. Um, I'm, I am a big fan of the new Boo Fighter. I know it's something we were going to talk about. Um, the, the, I know there's a few people that don't like the colour, but I think the shape of that kit, I, I don't buy die cast because of the, the the markings or the paints. I buy it because I love the aircraft. Yeah. And for me, that is a cracking piece of kit. If you're not bothered by the slight paint off, it's like, it is an absolute stunning piece of kit. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, like I said, there's, there's lots of dubiousness if there is such a word around, obviously the nasals aren't painted properly, but we'll get to that in a minute. But and the colour of the obviously the green as well, which which isn't great. But um, what we do, obviously, I don't want to grill you too long. Poor old Elliot needs he's probably fast asleep on the train yeah. home now. Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully he's got beer in his hand because yeah. yeah, he was absolutely brilliant to listen to. I could listen to him all day. Yeah. He's absolutely yeah, love the way he spoke. It comes from being passionate about obviously what he's producing as well. And again, you know, just now, but I mean. It's, the writing, which is already on, obviously, the site in terms of the Mark Hanna stuff, is, is second to none. And, you know, it's not me, it's not for me to slag off the current publications, but I think this is next level. Um, it's and, something so different, isn't it? It's As you said, yeah. it's something you're going to want to collect. It's almost, for me, it's like the highlights of the year or the years gone by into a book that you'll look back in 20 years' time and go, oh, do you remember? And it's that yeah. kind of heritage and throughout. It's Yeah, it sounds very exciting. To add a little perspective on the on the price, so if you think of flying legends now, I think uh, and quote quote me if I'm wrong. I don't know if Phil Glover's still on um, from Warbird like, Warbird Lovers, but I think the um, what you call it the publication that comes with flying legends the the like the oh what's it called How, what's the word like the collectible magazine you can get with the display info on. I yeah. think that was ten, yeah yeah I think and it that's was not far over ages long. So to put in perspective. Um, it's going to be, you know, like, I mean, the ph photographers involved in it. When you're talking Mr. John Dibbs, uh, before we even get to the likes of Harry and uh, John Romain's boy as well, is it, and Phil Chaplin, some great photography there and all different styles as well. And, you know, I think Dibbs is probably considered the greatest yeah. photographer of aircraft in the world. And so to get them, him on board, I think says an awful lot. But uh, it should be, uh, you know, it will be, the the you know it'll be a game changer and i'm really really proud to say i know the guy who's who's doing that as well so look we're going to move on to the next bit now andy and yeah that's you, me and you left now the lone rangers yeah waiting um, for andy to turn up to give to get this drawing we're all excited so the latest releases so this month we are due spitfire ml 407 i've seen some preview pictures of it, it looks yeah. very very good uh, had the fighter come through the last month we've had the ju88 come through from colgi as well uh, I don't think I've missed anything else from Colgi there, have I? Oh, no. the Swordfish. Swordfish. Oh, swordfish. Yeah, Swordfish, yeah. Um, I think they're all very solid releases, but they're not all perfect. Um, the Hobby Master poster, and I don't think Gary's on, actually. Gary's not tuned in tonight, but um, Gary was quite critical of the Hobby Master yeah, poster. He, he wasn't a happy boy, was he? He wasn't a happy boy at all. You had a chance to have a look at it? 
Yeah, I've had a look. I mean, Hobby, they're not a brand that I've really ever gone to. I've had a couple of their spits, um, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I always think they, they, they seem to produce a lot, which worries me from a quality point of view. Um, if you can produce that many different versions that quickly, is it going to be as good as the Corgi who almost do the opposite? At the moment, they're producing less and, and still making mistakes. But yeah, it's uh, for, for me, the two Mesher Smiths at the 148 scale, intriguing because I haven't got any in that scale in die cast. Um, I've only got slightly bigger. Um, and then what was the other one that I like? The, the, the Stealth Fighter, but again, is not one I've got in my collection from a modern jet point of view. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I let, from my point of view, obviously, on World War Two, predominantly, I mean, the 148 stuff doesn't really fuss me because I, I don't like mixing the scales. I can't be dealing with it. It's just one yeah. of the things, although he says, you know, he says that he's got a 148 Phantom, some 148 Lightnings, you know. But um, yeah. No, from that point of view, I mean, I just can't do it. Um, from World War Two point of view, from Hobbymaster, I don't know if it feels like a strategy, but they're sort of almost shifting it to Colby and saying, that's yours, we'll keep away from it. Yeah, it seems to be um, that way. Yeah, and same with the 148 Jets, they've not ventured into that yet. So there seems to be almost like a gentleman's agreement there, I say. There's not a lot there for um, for me. I mean, there was a, a Desert um, P40. There was a CIA A26, I believe, as well, which is quite an interesting yeah. release, um, a counter -invasion. Um, and there's two 148 Messerschmitts, I believe. I think yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. I think the bit for me, which I, I get is, is peeing off a lot of collectors, is the... This is the danger. When you re release 14 different releases a month, which, which is great for the hobby in, in some respect, they're now starting to go over the older stuff before. And I think I mentioned this in one of the previous Wings Monthlies, that I guess it devalues anybody who's got that in the collection. Yeah. And I can see why... The, a lot of anger i don't think it will stop people buying stuff i think it just gives people who would late to the party the opportunity to then buy it but then it devalues something it's a bit like the the gna typhoon that colgi released yeah at one point 150 160 quid you couldn't get it and of course then hobby master come along we were brilliantly retold typhoon did it and didn't quite nail it but it devalued the colgi one yeah probably. i understand yeah so i, I get where the frustration is i think gary from gary's point of view it just feels like um i guess it's yeah it's sort of covering the same old stuff but that, that's where they're at they're releasing so many schemes there's only so much they can how, do how many do um, they run in a, in a run mark how many is there is it similar numbers to what the corgi do yeah I, I think it's 500 so i think it's okay, considerably yeah. less but it, yeah i guess it depends on the release i mean someone else could i mean a distributor about but the reason they do so many is they split the run, don't they? So if they're going to knock out a thousand phantoms, they do two different schemes on them. Okay. So then you get a, an option which sort of makes complete sense, really. Yeah, yeah. Because they're just, they're just good from a buying point of view and a selling point of view. It makes sense completely. Yeah. yeah. Maximising their um, their their revenue. I mean, I, I, I don't know what. I mean, I don't think they publish their results and stuff like that. Hobby Master or whether they're part of a bigger group, I'm not entirely sure. But it's one of them ones. It's great for the hobby. All these releases. But it's also bad for the hobby in some respect that they're just churning out bits that ain't great. But I mean, George Witt has just put on there the upcoming Hobby Master Ben Walters F101C looks stunning. I completely agree. I think some of the stuff they churn out is amazing. Some of it isn't. I mean, some of it they, they get, they, like Corgi, they make schoolboy errors and completely yep. get it. Um, but it's a bit of a funny one, isn't it? It's like we want releases, but we want the right releases. I, get, I think Gary. Yep. Gary, you know, Gary can make whatever he wants because he's a fantastic code freer now. Um, I guess when someone like him says speaks up, then he must be pissed off. So uh, it's very unlike Gary yeah, when, to, to say that. No, when Gary talks, I listen, and um, that's something that I've learned over the last few years of knowing Gary. He's he helped me with the B seventeen, um, and he's someone that keeps pushing me to try and do more of, of the uh, of the Dubai. I think the airbrushing needs to come out before I I move more into diecast. I do love that. I love buying a cheap kit of someone smashed up on online on eBay and. And then getting it back and then and making it polishing up and looking good again. It is there's something very rewarding about that. So Jamie's just mentioned the QC on Corgi and Hobby yeah. Marshall. Perfect yeah. link up there, Jamie. Love that. Yeah, we will get onto that very, very shortly. But um, yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's not a lot on there for me, but you know, I, I, I did quote, and I'm sure a few of you who are watching the video will see that I did put on the Diecast Aviation Collectors page that. Um, Thou shall not slag off Hobby Master. They seem to avoid a lot of critique, while Corgi seem to get it with both yeah. barrels. 
best on, on on some of the forums, of course, not to mention MH3, Christian, if you're watching, who will be featured on the next Wings Monthly, may I add. Um, but I guess with Hobby Master, if they make a mistake this month, next month there's a complete set of different releases and it's instantly forgotten. You almost just forget um, it. Yeah, but I'm just saying, yeah, with the Corgi stuff, we, we, we wait with such weight, braided breath for that, that big collection to come out. And then a couple of times we've been disappointed. And then last one, we were a bit more excited, but then we're still worried about them little mistakes uh, with the Typhoon and, and, and the Marauder. They, they, yeah, they, they need to, yeah, stop. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jamie put the F-16, Mick Killeer was a howler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, well, uh, what do you expect he's been produced in a country where, where english is not the first language so and that's part of you know one of the many issues is that i guess hobby master are more on the doorstep but with colgi they're literally producing it on the other side of the world and you get chinese new year which takes a month out of production as yeah. well so but we'll get on to the colgi bit now so before we get on to the hopes of the next month's catalogue um let's talk a little bit i'll, I'll, I'll put it under colgi woes and it's been very, very heavily featured on the forum, especially Model Hangar 3, if anybody's obviously a member on there. So let's go through the last four last four releases from Colgate. So yep. first was the Royal Australian Air Force Canberra, and that had a number of issues, least of all the colour of the grey, uh, the bombs, the decals, uh, and the insignia. Uh, Christian was not a happy man, so not what they'd hoped for after all these years. Then you had the JU-88, brilliant looking scheme, lovely looking aircraft, but as someone pointed out, it's got the wrong gondola on the on the front of the aircraft. That one, uh, it's you've got, got one. You got that one? No, he's coming next month from Andy. Yes, uh, nice. I don't know if he's still on, but we need to add Andy very, very shortly. Um, but that will be coming next month with the Spitfire and potentially Dynamite, the B-26. Uh, the Royal Australian Air Force mm. Bowfighter, um, as we've already spoken about, lovely looking scheme dubious whether the green is correct although listening to mark harbour over on mall hangar free he seems to think that it looks it's an acceptable level which is good however the engines weren't um masked up and painted over with camo rather than the natural um metal finish which it should have and then you've got the swordfish where <clears throat> it's very minor but it's still it's still an error where the camo of the top half of the model doesn't necessarily meet the bottom half of the model um so they're the last four four releases all of them appear to be selling really really well the bow fighter is nearly sold out from what i gathered canberra is sold out the that's sold out because yeah that put me off i mean the talk of it so early on put, put me off buying it um i've got a couple of canberras but that one yeah i as soon as it's such negative talk around the groups, it, it put me off, and that's why I didn't buy that I'm one. Because yeah, and the sales and the swordfish and JU eighty eight, but both of them are very fine releases. Both of them, the swordfish and the bow, and uh, the last Dakota release are on their way for me from Lofty's Hobbies this month. I've had a heavy month. Uh, I've got two to pick up from Jason, and I've got two more coming from France that Gary's convinced me to buy as well. So he's dangerous, guy. <laughs> dangerous man. <laughs> I'm I'm off the wagon, unfortunately. So I, I think I need to go and see my counsellor again. Uh, yeah, so, it's on that thing happens, again with the pads. Ha happens to be Gary, I think. So I think he's not doing a very good job convincing me to buy more stuff. But um, how do you feel about these errors from Colgate? Um, I'll ask you first before I give my opinion. Um, someone that's fairly like not I don't know if I can sound new to to this, but you know I've I've only been collecting for three or four years now and, and kind of on a, on a long-term basis yeah it does put me off as soon as it's when i start reading things that it's that bad so that's really like i said with the camera it, it put me off the purchase that that many people were talking about how bad it was with the view fighter and, and for instance the marauder that is going to be coming out people saying it's the wrong marauder for the wrong paint and, and i kind of looked a bit more into that and it, it kind of makes sense why core give decided to go with that because it matches the one in the museum I'm not really bothered that the fact that the, the wing is three degrees out of what it should be, and it, it, that kind of thing that doesn't bother me. And I, I will pre-order that one. I, I've been saving up. I've got forty-two pounds worth of, of discount to put on that when that comes around. So, um, yeah, that that one, yeah, I'll definitely be buying. Uh, the swordfish doesn't really fit in with any of my collection, so that's why I didn't go for that one. And neither did the Ju in the, in the snow. Uh, I didn't, I didn't get that one either. It didn't really fit in. So yeah, just. So to add about the B26, obviously I've got that coming at some point. I would imagine 
goodbye time. They said early summer. Um, I think Mark, who will hopefully be on next month's Wings Monthly, uh, who's over on the Model Hangar Forum, he's a fantastic source of information. Oh. You know, some could really lean on a little bit more. He mentions this, obviously, Dynamite, for those who don't know, is a B model scheme modelled on a G model, which is based in the Utah Beach Museum, which I completely get. Um, does it bother me massively? No. Will they be able to do both types of um, wing and tail? Yes. Will yeah. the engine be uh, an early B? Probably not. So they've had to make some decisions. I don't know whether they'll have a look at retooling that. I mean, like for me, it's only if you know yeah. that does it really go off. And, and for me, it doesn't because as long as the scheme, which the pre-pro looks banging, if they deliver that scheme the way it delivered, then I'll be over the moon and it will make my forces of valor one look pretty yeah. ordinary in comparison, which are decent models for those who don't have. Yeah, them. no, that's the other one. Um, it's a good one, yeah. I mean, the Canberra one, again, you know, I, I, said, I spoke to Christian about that. I mean, it doesn't really bother me because it wasn't one that I was really going to go after and get. Um, but the uh you know if you're a royal australian air force fan and you're really passionate about the impact of the canberra in the vietnam war and you've been pushing colby for years and years and years to do it to deliver that would be really really disappointing especially when the information had been provided by someone like mark to colby to make sure it was right but then from colby's point of view i'm sure i you know i, I absolutely understand that michael would have been livid about it because they want to yeah. get it right I'm going to deliver substandard product because actually it makes them look bad as well and questions are raised over them so it's that communication issue which we've had so many times before with the typhoon one side of the world to part of the world if you're not watching what's going on these mistakes really really happen yeah, and for, you know, for me that that's got to be the worst one surely oh yeah definitely definitely with the, the, the yeah that's it. i mean the ju88 am i bothered it's the wrong gonza no. not really i mean he looks banging. I've got the first black night fighter release, so I've got to have the second one naturally. The bow fighter, well, I'll make a decision on that when I get to do a video re review with it um, next time round. But I've got something handy to me now, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this, when you talk about great releases, this is a fantastic release. You know, the, it's just stunning, a stunning bit of kit. That's Colgi at their absolute best. I've got the the D-Day Spitfire, which I'm leaning the, the camera against right now as well. Fantastic release, fantastic mould. You know, I would say now pushes Gemini out to second place, in my opinion. So, I mean, look, look it's, I get the frustration. Um, I, I don't think that will ever go away. Um, was, so, Jamie's just asked, was the Canberra pre-pro at Riyadh the, the correct colour? I don't think it was. Yeah. I don't think it was quite right. But back at that point, I think the lighting in the tent at Riyadh was not right which give it a different um opinion uh, just going back to another couple of people who've just uh, commented on there so i've got lammy mcflab i think is that you is that scott from down in new zealand uh, it might well be i hope hopefully it is um just said he wants corgi to start doing modern tooling like a poseidon wedge show i can't see that i think it's more out there their their zone to be honest with you i think that's more of an in-flight sort of or somewhere you get from retail aviation direct he said obviously he, was, he think the camera is okay personally and that's exactly the point everybody's yeah. opinion is completely different he's also said like a hamden i think that potentially will happen once the one at cosford is fully built and assembled a firefly battle sea fury sea venom range would be fantastic completely agree on all three of them and i yeah, think um, i think a battle would make more sense and a firefly would fit into the history of flight range from oxford but i think that's died a death now um actually just sort of to just add something on oxford um for those who, who follow oxford and of course colgate it's uh, the ceo obviously taff um has had a very very tough few months and uh, you know had a major heart operation and as part of that uh, heart operation uh, has lost his sight hope I, I don't know whether it's practical to get it back or not obviously eloise his daughter put a big statement on the oxford thing and i, I just uh, from all of us in the community not just from dwc we wish him all the work all the best the man has made a fantastic job of getting hornby as a business back on track so just the way i love from us to to the obviously to Taff and Eloise and all the family and, and hope you know for a speedy and best recovery as possible. Uh, horrible news to to read earlier last week. Um, let's hope everything goes as well as it possibly can. Obviously, Sam just commented as well. They've gone to the trouble of doing a new Vietnam box design. More Vietnam releases on the way. 
an AC forty seven would be amazing if they can modify the DAC tooling. Yes, as long as they can't, they can undo it. That's to keep it from me because a D Day Dakota is just printing money for uh, Colby, isn't it? And I've got Night Fright on the way as well, so I can't wait to do um, a review on that as well. So let's get to the Colby catalog before um, we get to the, the the end of this. Uh, Rather interesting, as as always. You know, it always uh, almost surprises me actually how interesting these 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 are. Talking to different people, talking to the likes of Elliot, and Michael in a previous one, and obviously Christian and Sam. It's, it always amazes me that I just think oh, I'll be half an hour, and then an hour and a half in, and we're still flowing. So thanks for everyone for sticking with us so far. So like I said, we'll share it on you on YouTube as well. Um, so the Colgi May twenty twenty four catalog. Any predictions? They'll go D Day, surely. And I mean, what was that one? So what, the Dakota, a Bowfighter, a Spitfire, and a B26, right? So, yeah. Them There's got to be a Mustang. Yeah, got to be. Maybe even, we're talking about bringing old toolings out of the, out of hibernation, the P47. Yeah. That hasn't been out for a while. Yeah, that would look at, yeah. I mean, we've got a few D-Days already. I think I've got three D-Days in the B-47. You've probably got about seven of them. Yeah. Uh, well, so good. good night to the aviation officiado who's off to bed uh, over in uh, over in Mumbai. Good night, mate. Have, have a good sleep. Um, George Witt, Witt has just put about B-17 Roses Riveters. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The glider like, uh, was the the other one I've talked about, yeah, I think it was I'm a flyer, yeah, Corsa Glider. And I don't know if they'll do that, but that would be uh, for me. Uh, There's no new tooling until January, at least. I can't, yeah, I can't see anything in. new. I love, I don't, well, I hope there's going to be a Masters of the Air thing because you got, you know, you could do something very, very great for, you know, another double set, a 100th, uh, you know, Regensburg mission one, or I, I don't know, there's so much. It, it, that, it, it did so well as a series it, it, you'd be silly not to jump on that bandwagon in some way uh, i think they'll they will repeat what they've done with the the spitfire the two-seater spitfire i think they'll continue that and maybe produce other ones that are out there on the market that people are flying up in i think the d-day mark one from big in here i forget the uh the one at Duxford pv202 but i forget the name of the one at big in hill um there's one which is d-day stripe where just re redone the stripes and of course big in hill was the one who obviously commissioned the model as well and an interesting point was that um michael did say that the tr9 had outsold the other two mark nines combined i think so for such an ugly duckling i mean it's a brilliant tie in uh, as much as whether you like a tr9 or not it's a brilliant time you fly in the spitfire might as well have a model of one you buy the model yeah Absolutely. the same yeah i mean they, 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 they did so well with just jane it, it just seems silly not to repeat that across of course the market i i even look at you know they did a, a an old pack with some of the old the old legends and when i was at when i was a kid out on the and they, they, they'd still sell well uh you know you know guts no glory them kind of them, them classics from the past you put some of them in a, in a multi-pack they'd still sell as well as they want that, that go out there now leb would be a brilliant release uh around d-day um you know an actual flyer uh one yeah. that can go pictures of at site well pretty readily yeah um i mean that, that new scanner they've got i mean that must be a game changer for corgi and for Epix. the fact they can go now put it in front of a plane scan it and get an exact model of the thing that was in front of them that must be a game changer yeah um i think in terms of predictions for me i can there's i think there's another both all coming yeah. there was a bomber release which was put on the model hangar 3 it, i think it was leaked on corgi usa the start of last year it hasn't turned up anywhere so I think there'll be a second bomber that makes sense. Uh, released. I, I, I can imagine the Phantom tooling being re brought out and maybe uh, Black Mike. Yeah. It's easy to do. Can't really go wrong with an all black aircraft. No. Uh, I've already got one, two, three, four. Yeah, a number of them next to me. Seven, a P-51, maybe something Luftwaffe. I can't see the, the Hornets coming out this time. I, I think that'll be January until that yeah. comes out. They'll yeah, get, they will do that. I, it wouldn't surprise me if it's a FW 190, a D Day FW 190 Duke. Because yeah. I don't think they've done a D Day one. They did the D Day ME 109G, didn't they? As part of the last D Day set. Yeah. But they haven't done a 190. And I believe two of them strafed the beach, didn't they? I don't yeah. think they've done that. So, yeah, a 190 would be good. 
Um, I'm not even tired. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a B25 of some sort from Sicily to tie in with the um, Allied Invasion of Sicily release. Yeah, if it wasn't this leave will launch, they've done that before, haven't they, a number of times or at least once. It wouldn't surprise me if you see something Operation Torch. I don't know what that would be, where it'd be the Spitfire Operation I don't, honestly, Again, it feels weird just to release the one Operation Torch aircraft. I think there might be something that accompanies it, maybe a Hurricane. Yeah, that Hurricane makes sense. Operation Torch. Um, I, I don't know whether that would be the old, the older style 2D or 2C, V or, or or whatever it may be, a B, C or D, whatever it may be, with the cannons potentially. Yeah. Uh, so that might come out. Um, we haven't had a helicopter for a while, so uh, maybe something from the historic her- helicopters range, like a green jungly, uh, a green sea king, because there's one obviously flying from navy wings now. Yeah. Makes um, sense. There, there's, there's there's so many options, but the, what's nice is they're bringing out tools I haven't used for years. It wouldn't even surprise me. There's a second camera to come to yep. put right the first one something different maybe a Malayan campaign camber or something along them lines that, that I, I really have no idea I've no, I have no inklings as to what's coming you know Michael hasn't shared it there's potentially another electric English electric lightning a black, maybe a black one that'd be an interesting one two 148s but I think yeah. I need to uh, yeah they said we talk about the B-17 I can't see there being a D-Day Sterling or glider tug Halifax. I think they need too much adjustment to the tooling to release. Um, this one, yeah, it's been released for about two years now. So Halifax is a potential one as well. Uh, have I forgot anything? As P thirty eight, we just had, haven't we? We've had Papa yeah. Rose. So yeah, we've got three anymore. of them already there, aren't they? Yeah. Um, we just had a black typhoons. Any typhoon? I mean, they've done a few D Day ones. Potential bomber typhoon. We haven't had a bomber yeah. typhoon for a while. Um, no, that's all. Awesome style bombs because obviously they got pulverized the four wrong didn't they with the wrong size bombs so potentially one of them and a uh, day mosquito was the other one i was thinking yes and the b24 as well when was the last b24 release well, it was which they it a few years back yeah so b24 i can't see a b24 and a b17 being released in the same catalog or a lancaster i think I think at Lancaster, we might see a little bit of a break for for now, but we've well, done two or three <laughs> last year. We haven't even had that. They might, might give it a six three three squadron mosquito. Not a bad yeah, shout. That'd be a good shout. Yeah, I think if be a mosquito, there, I think it might tie into D Day something along them sort of lines. Yeah, I um, thought that'd be there. That's their easy win, surely, from a, maybe, from a marketing point of view. Maybe even one of the current flyers, maybe the X Rod Lewis one, which has gone out to California now, the all blue Banff one. That is a stunning bit of kit, and the Banff one hasn't been released. And it would be a nice tie in to the Royal Australian Air Force bow fighter as well. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, have I missed anything? We haven't had Spitfire ones in a while either. Um, no. True. Uh, P51D tugboat from Empire of the Sun. No, Jersey Jerk. I've already asked about Jersey Jerk. Apparently, Michael has forwarded it through i don't know where it sits in the long line of things but jersey jerk in 172 would be oh be lovely one that, one. that would be good that would be on my I'm list just looking up at my my dad's collection up there uh, we've not had a p40 for a while we've not yeah. had a meteor for a while because that's in the new the new mold meteor only ever had three releases um you know we've got another 172 um so, oh, sorry one four one God, my 148 Typhoon, potentially, maybe Blackjack. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Blackjack. I don't think there's nothing new in terms of red arrows, in terms of schemes this year, so I don't think there's nothing radically new there. No. Um, so what are we expecting? To... Yeah. Do you really think a normal size, something a bit different? Or what, what were we thinking from Corgi? Were they, were they treat us keen, or were they, you know, give us another shorter? I, I think, so how many person was it? Six. I think yeah. they're going to be even i think it'll be six six and six to keep it balanced yeah. but they're churning them out quicker and on time they just got to get the little silly things wrong i guess uh fixed yeah um so this is this is again you know you talk about diecast fans people moan because oh i've ordered a call it's taken 18 months to get to or people moan go i've ordered a call it's taken three months to produce but they produced it wrong yeah. so what would you can't, want can't really win. yeah somewhere but in between would be the ideal situation wouldn't it for yeah. sure it would it certainly would right so on our final bit so latest edition so what have your three latest additions been to your um 
your collection then, Andy? Ooh, uh, Youth Fighter, um, the latest Messerschmitt from Corgi. And what was the last one I got? Any cheeky ones? What was the last? Oh, the Buccaneer with the oh, the Saints one. This one. Right. I, yeah, I, I already had the Tornado and the Jaguar. So, yeah, that finished my collection. I'm just trying to- my selection. So the last three I've had were um, obviously the the stunning Bowfall. For those who don't know, obviously Lemmy McFlair McFlair was saying that I've made him buy it. I did not do such a thing. Uh, so in terms, uh, oh okay, one of the two Rocket Arm FW on the nineties over the Gold Beach. Haven't had one in a while. Yes. Oh, there it is. That's on my on its way to me. That yeah, she's a beauty. Right. It just looks right. It's a stunning kit. No, I do, I, I never I haven't got my hand on the original re- release of the of this. It's one of the ones, but it, it goes up too quickly in price, and I'm trying to nab one at the right price. But yeah, it is a the cracking kit. It's a magnificent piece of kit. I mean, the very first one was very sheeny, uh, but a great kit. The only thing mm-hmm. I've made an error of is in terms of the if it has a torpedo, it can't sit on its stand, which is a little bit of a pain yeah. in the bum. Yeah, I know so, that. Last three for. Me. Me. I can tell everybody what's on my way. So uh, I've got the uh, all black uh, Colombia um, Defiant, which is a stunning bit of kit. The Beaufort, uh, and before that was I'm trying to look over there. I've got an FW 190. When did I get that? Oh my god! Yeah, you know you're getting them now, Mark. They're coming through, and you don't even know you got them. <laughs> When did, yeah, when did I get that? Apparently, I bought a Dragon FW 190 as well. I'm just looking over there, there. But yeah, I remember you put that online. I remember seeing the picture of it. Yeah, I could tell you. you oh, of course, yeah, that was the desert, um, the Russian desert one, if you're such a term. Of course, I got that. That's a brilliant bit of kit. That um, I can tell everybody what's on its way, which will be reviewed over the coming week. So I have free a parcel from Andy uh, Beck on its way, which includes the Night Fright Dakota the Royal Australian Air Force bow fighter, which you've just shown me, uh, and the new Operation Torch Swordfish. So Jason, who's usually on, but he's over watching Ipswich, hopefully go back to the top of the league tonight. Um, I've got to pick up uh, the red, white and blue Jaguar from him and the twin stick Hunter from my dad. I'll put on the top shelf. Uh, and I've also ordered from France uh, from a lady over on the Dicos Aviation Marketplace. If you aren't on that, folks, get on there. Some brilliant models to be found. I've ordered a Dragon Stuka, uh, which I'm really excited about receiving. They're rare as hen's teeth. And also a Witty Wings uh, P38, which in like a blue and D-Day uh, scheme, which is really hard to find. I've got it for a brilliant price. And then next month is the Black JU88 and the Spitfire 9 ML407, which obviously the one represented based at Cywell, as well as potentially Dynamite if it comes through as well. So just the 10 on the way. Um, oh, and I bought a second Spitfire 9 off of, um, yes, I did, Jamie Epp from Blandine Cats. <laughs> um, I've also got a second D-Day um, Spitfire 9 beer barrel on the way for my dad as well, which I got for 20 quid off of eBay. It's got a broken prop, but I can repair that, so it's not a... Uh, for 20 quid, I ain't going to turn that no, down, uh, even if it there's is. Some, there's some bargains out there on the, on the, on the old eBay. You have to just find them. I think it might, might end up going to Gary at some point as a, um, a repaint. I was going, I was thinking about painting it as the Silver Spitfire, uh, yeah. but I looked at the rudder, it's a different type of rudder. It's the, it's the rounded rudder rather than the, the pointed rudder, which is the Silver Spitfire. So that's everything from me. Right. Before we get to anything, I now need to see if we can invite Andy back on. Um, he's out. I've just seen he is there. He's hiding in the shadows. Hiding in the shadows. Although I will say a little disclaimer for everybody. Um, I don't know whether Andy talk or whether he looked like he's had a stroke. He's had some work done on his mouth tonight at the dentist. Poor man. Um, not only has he just received pain, but he's had to pay um, uh, obviously for that service as well from the dentist. So I'm sure he's probably got the ump. So for anybody who's tuned in, good evening, Andy. Uh, another beer. Is like the big convention. Um, so um, I hope you're feeling well. How are you feeling after the butcher's done that to your mouth? I can't really speak much, so I will have to keep it short and sweet. So for anybody who knows, Andy obviously runs Lofty's Hobby. He was a guest on Wing Monthly episode one, I believe. We spoke about it. Um, and he run this fantastic raffle over on the DWC page over on Facebook, which included seven aircraft. I can't remember the, the seven aircraft, but included 
uh, the 148 yeah, GR7. I think is, is it GR7 or GR9? Um, Help me out here. I'm rubbish. GRs. Well, anyway, yeah, very yeah. nice. Oh, GR9. There you go. Uh, it's 148 scale, as well as six other aircraft in Legion IL2. So, Andy, over to you to do this live raffle to be our, our lucky winner. Okay, um, so I'm going to do it on the uh, Google random number generator. Yep. Um, I just, just want to say thank you to everyone who has jo uh, who has taken part. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, how do you turn the camera around on this? Uh, on the top of the screen, be a little uh, two arrows. Got it. And uh, check it out. So. Just to prove that there's nothing dodgy going on or anything like that, I've done 1,000 to 2,000. Um, I'll do change it to 1 to 120. If I land on a number that's not taken, because there are a few places that haven't been taken yet, I'll just generate it again. Yeah, that's fine, mate. That's fine. I'm good. Just keep and the number three. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what numbers I've made, to be honest with you. Right. Okay. Good luck, everybody. Go on. All the best, everyone. Do you need a drum roll? 36. Let's have a look. 36. Matt Cole. Where's it gone? Yeah, there we are, Matt Cole. Well done, Matt. Oh, close would I. So close. So close. Um, next couple of days, I'm going to put another raffle on the go. It won't be as big as this one. I'll maybe do one or two Hobby Master and um, maybe one or two Corgi. I might even put um, a thing up just before and maybe have a vote. You know, I'll get a list. Couple of corgi, couple of hobby masks to see what people want and yeah. do a vote and do it that way. Yeah, yeah. Way doing it. yeah amazing. Yeah, well done. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, well done, Matt. No, well done. That's look, look, but this is about that. But, but I say well done, Matt Cole, but obviously well done, Andy, for putting up such a mega raffle. Seven aircraft, you know, 500, 600 quid's worth of gear going on there. A brilliant, brilliant uh, thing to do. And, you know, like I said, more. More uh, to come clearly down the line. So, congratulations, Matt. Uh, remember your mates. Um, but no, no, enjoy. You know, what a brilliant thing to, to win. Um, and glad to say we paid a part as well. But obviously, we haven't done, we haven't done nothing. It's all down to Andy and his amazing business uh, over at uh, Lofties, who's costing me a bloody fortune, but he's doing it at the best possible price. So, thanks, mate. Um, look, just really to summarize the at the, at the end of the call, massive Elliot, who obviously is now not on uh, the call, and Dan, who just briefly joined at the end to watch her. And of course, a massive to, to Andy for finally getting his opportunity to stand on. I'm sure he'll come on again at some um, Well, both the Andys will be on at some point as well. But, um, you know, like I said, Andy Beck, if you want to do this on a regular basis and jump on the end of the, the Wings Monthly, you're more than welcome to use this to help. Uh, look, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'll share the the Instagram page and then send it onto YouTube and then share it onto uh, Facebook as well. Uh, yes, Lammy McFlab, uh, I will say Lofty is a fantastic service, can't recommend enough. Look, the best, for sure. He's taken much, much of my money too. Uh, the job he does for all of us, you know, not just me and, you know, and Dan and the guys who run the page, but everybody within the page. It's great to, uh, to have someone like that involved with us along the way. So, look, Again, I'll share on the back of this um, how to sign up to the Vintage Aviation Echo. Please get behind uh, Elliot and the guys. They're, they're, they're offering a brilliant product, um, you know, to, 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 to put onto the market um, as the air show season fast approaches. Um, you won't be disappointed when you read and see it and have that sitting on your coffee table. But that's it from me, guys. Thank you for everyone who's contributed tonight. Thank you for everyone who's stuck with us, watching, uh, commenting, asking questions. The reason we do this is, you know, is we don't make any money out of it. We do it because we enjoy this hobby, and it's lovely to have the opportunity to chat 
the people, like-minded people who love aviation, love collecting models, um, and, 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 and sharing that with, with all the use. Um, look, please help share the page, bring more people to it, uh, bring more people to the community. It's a great, it's a great source of information. There's some great, you know, people on, on the group who have got detailed history, who are really passionate about what they do and what they support. But that's it from me. Um, we'll see you next month on episode four, where I'll be featuring Christian and hopefully Mark Harbour from the Model Hang of Free Forum. Talk about the trials and tribulations um, of running the forum. I've also got potentially Matt Smith, who's one of my mates uh, who works at Wheeled Aviation, who works on historic air helicopters, predominantly WASPs, uh, working with Hunter at the moment as well. Uh, hopefully we'll get him involved as well and see if we can talk about the actual historic aviation scene and the part he plays in terms of maintaining and signing off and restoring these old warbirds and get back into the air for our shows. Look, that's it from me. Have a lovely week, guys. Um, and like I said, thanks for tuning in, following the page, supporting the page uh, and supporting the people we associate with the page like Andy and Elliot. Have a great week, a lovely weekend. Cheers, guys. Thanks, gents. Cheers. 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 Cheers